Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today we are joined by entrepreneur turned reality TV and social media star. Dan, Dylan, I want you to know, me saying that almost made me want to throw up, but it's the truth. Dylan Barber. Many of you know Dylan from his time on The Bachelorette and Bachelor in Paradise, where he met his now fiance, Hannah Godwin. What you may not know is that Dylan is the co-founder of a fitness company, more tech than anything, that allows people to work out while donating food to those in need. It's an unbelievable app. Today we are going to learn what it is like to build a startup company from scratch. Hear Dylan's thoughts on his experience in Bachelor Nation and where he sees it's going from here. But most importantly, what we're going to get into with Dylan is you guys most definitely probably don't know about his expertise in CPG investing. He's a brilliant investor, sophisticated, deep acumen, probably one of the most in the Bachelor franchise, and we're getting into that. Dylan, thank you so much for being on Trading Secrets. Thanks for having me, man. That was uh, the first half of the intro was pretty brutal. The second half was good. What, the brutal part that was um, being on the Bachelor, your the engagement, that you're a star. reality TV star. A... Do you think you are a reality TV star? No. Why? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. You were the star of Paradise. Uh, I'm one of one of many. We're all stars in our own right. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I kind of like it. Seems like a fever dream. Okay. Do you have a good relationship with the show? Like, when you look back on it, are you like, that was amazing, it was great, or are you just indifferent? Uh, I had a great time, like, obviously, but I think my, I don't know, there was like a six-month span post-show where I was a little reckless, cavalier, some with, might say. With, with like, with, the chirping and with stuff? With the chirping, uh, which I was like, thinking about that the other day, I was like, why would I do that? But I'm 28 now, I'm a man, so <laughs> we've matured. Why do you think you did do it? I just know. stir it up a little bit. Yeah, I, I like to. I like to stir it up. But you don't stir it up now like you used to. Yeah, I'm very tame now. Why I, is I it? To, Did Hannah reel you in? I, I've been reeled in <laughs> by multiple people. You can't wreck that massive career of hers. Not anymore. No, I'm. A, I was a liability for a minute there. <laughs> I love it. All right, let's get into your career pre-show. What were you doing, and what was the process like when you left to go on the show? Yeah, I <clears throat> so I went to school on the East Coast. If you go to school in the Northeast, like especially a liberal arts school, you're probably going to work in banking. So I did uh, public finance investment banking at Citigroup for a summer, and then left that. Graduated as, a, as an intern. As an intern, yeah, yeah. As an intern, what do you make doing something like that? I think it was like twenty grand. Okay. For a summer. And the goal with that, like anyone that's in banking or trying to get into banking consulting, the big thing is you're trying to land an internship, right? Because yeah. you need the job. The, for the most part, you want that offer going into your senior year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the that's the big thing. Like if you come into it with a job offer your senior, year, you can just like do whatever the, whatever you want. Uh, I didn't get the job offer, which like was probably de deservedly so. I like would work really hard, but I never asked questions. And I think I realized that like that was like a fault. I should know like why I was doing something. I would just be like, yeah, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Hmm. So that was one thing I kind of like took with me after that. Question but, on that. Yeah. The people that did get the offer, I'm just curious. Citigroup, going to your senior year, how much were they getting offered and were their signing bonuses? Uh, it's six figures, I think, to start. And then I think around like maybe like a 10 to 20 grand signing bonus. Okay, but cool. then you have to pay it back if you leave after a year gotcha. or w within a year. Okay, that dangling carrot's always there in big corporate. Yeah, pretty brutal. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, so I, I graduated. Banking's like pretty intense. If anybody has done it, you work till like 1 a.m. I feel like, and you have no social life. So I didn't want to do that. I did private wealth management, which is like the polar opposite at Morgan Stanley. So it was super tame. I would have like nothing to do come like three o'clock and so i would like go home take a nap wake up <laughs> study for the cfa because i was like I'm, i need to be challenged in some capacity and then like work out for two and a half hours and then just go to sleep and do it all over again wealth management in new york city or where are we working uh i worked in palo alto lived in north beach in okay okay gotcha so san fran and so uh how old are you at this time 22. 22 first job out of school? Yeah. Ultra net worth or net worth? Like, what's the size of clients you're working with? It, it was, it, it would range. Like, some people would have like $10 million and $20 million, and some people would have like a million dollars. And if you didn't really have like over 500K, like 90,000 base plus bonus, how far off am I? Pretty far off, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What well, can you I, make I in a job was, like that? I think, well, I was in like an associate's program, so I was like making like 50 grand. And it was like a five grand bonus. Okay. And like living in the, and if you can't like, if you're not an advisor and you don't like get any type of like commission, 
on anything. It's just like, I'm just like capped. Got it. So I was like, well, I'm not really doing anything. I need to learn something. So <clears throat> you take the series tests. Then I was like, oh, the CFA sounds hard. Like, why don't I just do that? Uh, and so I passed the first one, passed the second one, and then I quit my job, started Pfizer, and went on The Bachelor. So, so. did you go for your third series again? I haven't done it yet. That's crazy. <laughs> okay, so guys, just to put it out there, like CFA, in my opinion, is the hardest designation by a long shot. Also, if you hear us sipping over here, we are pre-gaming the LA Rams game. But that being said, it's the hardest designation, I think, in any business category or designation that's out there. You have to take three tests. You can only take the sit for the test once a year, yep. right? The percentage of people that fail the test, I believe, is in around 60% or so, about only 40% and passing no, rate. I think it's higher. It's higher? I think it's a higher fail rate. Okay, so yeah. fail rates, like let's call it 70%. We'll do the research. We'll bring it to the recap. But the point is, you can only take it once a year. You fail it, you have to wait a year. So to pass two for two is like extremely impressive not well, to pump your tires anymore. and i took them in six months so the the first test you can take twice a year so like uh, i think it's like december and june so then i think i took mine in december and then the second test is once a year so i was like fuck it i'm just gonna take the second one so then i took it six months later that's really impressive why didn't you take it why didn't you finish it because uh, of the show yeah because then the next time 12 months later i was on the in paradise okay growing up in high school were you always like ultra smart top of your class no okay so it's just if you put your mind to it you're there yeah that's that i actually have like a very strong belief about that like i i mean i got like a 3.0 in high school i think i had like a 3.0 in college like super average grades and then when i didn't get the job after my internship i have like a massive chip on my shoulder and i was like oh my god like i'm just gonna put my mind to it like th i nearly aced the series seven i think i got like a 97 on it damn i was like i'm just gonna study super hard and so like that's kind of how I operate now with stuff, like especially at a startup, like it doesn't really matter you, if you just do everything you can to try and figure it out, like you can accomplish it. CFA much tougher than series seven, but series seven is another one that a lot of people take and will fail their first time. So that's extremely impressive. If you fail, you get fired. At Morgan Stanley. Yeah. So you have one shot. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of press. It's like performance anxiety when I you know. take a test. Yeah. Okay. So you, you get through that. You got your CFA. You then get called on the show. How'd the show find you? Who, who put you in the hat to, to be on the show? Yeah, so I <clears throat> I ended up quitting Morgan Stanley to start Visor, and then okay. I think it was about eight eight or nine months later, a producer reached out to me on Instagram and was like, hey, I'm a casting producer for The Bachelor and Bachelorette. Like, we'd love to talk to you. They and just it, DM'd you? Yeah, it was Lindsay. This is bullshit. I just said, oh, Clayton came on too. And I told like the, the, the shit I had to go through and like this and that. We had the regionals. Hawk's in the room here. Hawk and I both went to regionals. We both <laughs> called each other. And we go, dude, you're never going to believe this. You're never going to believe this. And a producer called us at the same time and said, hey, we want you to go on The Bachelorette. And I'm like, get the fuck. Like, we both got offered to go on. We both go to regionals. Then they do uh, like what I call nationals, but they bring top 50 to LA. And here you are just getting a DM. Yeah, so I got Must the end, nice. and then I said no. Uh, Why'd you say no? Well, I'd never seen the show before, and I was just like, I'm not the type of person to like be like an influencer, public, or things like that. So I was like, I don't really want to get involved. And then I told my mom about it, and she, and she was like, Well, what's like the worst that can happen? And I was like, I mean, a lot of things could happen <laughs> and be very bad. Uh, and then I ended up responding. I was like, Hey, you know, if this is still an opportunity, I'd love to learn more. Did a FaceTime with Lindsay, went up to LA, came back, just like met with a few people and then did the hotel thing where you stay the night and then they told me like a month later. Gotcha. Now you, you'd mentioned your mom. Your mom, she's in media and entertainment to some extent, right? She's an attorney? Yeah. It's like okay. uh, entertainment law. So okay. clearance, clearing things to like, I, I'm like bad at explaining this, Yeah. but essentially it's like if a movie or a show or a song is like using a name or a logo or a brand, like, so they don't get sued. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And then she's going to be mad at me if I explain that wrong, but that's okay. to my knowledge. That makes, that makes sense. Right. So if like this show was meaningful uh, and big, which, you know, could <laughs> question mark it's getting and there. white claw was here like essentially there's there could be like a, a, a some type of law issue with white it, claw yeah it's here. like uh if you're just watching like a netflix show and someone has like a pepsi shirt on 
Okay, got it. It's like, so you don't okay. get... Interesting. It's like Pepsi doesn't see you. So I'm surprised that you said no, and then you're not with her background, like knowing all the, the forms of... It was like, yeah, no, it's great. Go yeah, for it. Yeah, I'm surprised my mom was totally fine with it. But then she was like, don't sign the contract until I read it. And I'm like, well, you're going to have a ton of like edits, and they're not going to make the edits. So how about I just skip that step and sign it, and then you can be mad at me afterwards. Did she look at the contract? After I signed it. And what did she say? She's not happy about it. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, we'll, we, we'll leave it at that because I don't want any cease and desist at our door. But <laughs> it's a wild sign off. Yeah, it's a doozy. It's but a doozy. But we live in California, which is like the most friendly. For to, contracts. For people, yeah. Yeah, like non-competes in California don't really it exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah, it's like yeah. fake. Okay, all right. So you go on the show, but you're running. You're now not working for Morgan Stanley. You're done with the finance. You, you start Visor. You're eight months in. That's got to be a pretty tough thing to just leave to go film a reality show. Yeah. It, my cousin was – so I start the company with my cousin. Um, she was definitely not happy about it, which makes sense just because it's like, yeah, I'm going to be gone for who knows how long. Um, <clears throat> but I think for me, like, I just kind of wanted to do it for personal reasons and just give it a shot and just see what happens. Um, she kind of, like, what was weathering the storm while I was gone. But then I came back. And she was like, cool, like, let's get back to work. I was like, yeah, I really want to, but I've got to go to go paradise <laughs> for a month. So. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, let's back up a second. So you start Visor. Visor's doing great now. But when you start up, how you and your cousin started together. Did you take a 50-50 equity? No, it's women-owned. So she she started the company, like, 2000, uh, 2017, maybe, okay. and had the original idea and then told me about it while I was at Morgan Stanley. And then I, I was like, oh, I love that, like, I love the tangibility of it. I love the wellness space. Like, I want to be a part of it. So then I quit and moved down. And so we split it, not 50-50, but okay. something close to it. Got it. Something close to it. Understood. So then you get involved. At this point, eight months in, you're not taking money. Like, you're not, you're not getting paid oh, off no, this, no, right? Oh, no, 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 yeah. no. We, so, no we, we still don't really pay ourselves, like, market salaries for sure. And it's been almost five years. Wow. But, but, like, uh, yeah, you, you don't make any money. So, like, the first year, we didn't even know. Like, you don't even know what you're doing. Like you just, we were like, this is the rough idea. Let's meet with as many people as possible. Tell them what we're doing, get their feedback, like have them poke holes in it. And then let's go to the next meeting with it a little more fine tuned. Okay. And we did that for the first 12 months. Uh, we didn't even have an app. We just like, Sam designed the screens and we put them in a clickable prototype. And we'd be like, hey, the app's gonna be ready in two weeks. Can you give us feedback? It was ready like 14 months later. But, <laughs> Sounds right. Uh, yeah, so, the, so we just met with like probably three or 400 people the first year. We would just drive all over San Diego, uh, just like asking people, doing customer interviews, and just trying to figure out like what the hell we were doing. Okay, and your app is pretty intensive, but I think the number one question I get about apps in the range is just all over the place. What does it cost to get an app built like that? Yeah, it, it depends. So <clears throat> I think firms are like way too expensive. So if you go to like a contracting firm, we went to somebody and they said like bare minimum 150 grand, which okay. is pretty high. Uh, a lot of that like you can you can cut down if you do design so like since we designed the screens and did the wireframe and was like when you click this button it goes to this page like all they had to really do is connect it okay. we, we got a contractor to do it for like 20 grand oh nice but it was That's... it i mean mvps like we had to tear it all down eventually yeah, but okay. but uh yeah like to get started like you could use figma use envision to do the screens and the wireframe and then find somebody to just like connect it okay so it worked out obviously when you went on the show because you come back you then have some following so you could bring more attention to the app at any point though is your cousin and, I've, and i'm asking this because in my experience with my boss is like the big question are you gonna get fired like did your even though your family did your cousin at all say like i don't know like this could really hurt the business and did you almost think about not going because of that yeah no i never thought about not going okay uh, <laughs> but, but it was like always a chance like we're like, yeah, I mean, if I go on and just like hate it by the entire world, then that just like completely kills the business and I'll have to disassociate myself. And like, that was definitely a risk. I obviously knew that wasn't gonna happen. So uh, yeah, it ended up working out. But like the goal of going on was never really to promote the app. Like actually right, when, right before I went on, we actually restricted the app to people only in San Diego. Interesting. Why? We just like, did, it wasn't like ready to be okay. seen at all okay, still like it. still like we're working on it it's getting better i mean the, the the company itself is is not really a wellness app anymore it's like I, we equate it to like amazon for the health and wellness space to where 
Amazon has multiple products, right? They've got AWS, they've got Amazon Streaming, they've got their marketplace. Like, we're in a similar boat to where we've got our incentive app. We've got this like really interesting tool that we're about to launch next month that is kind of like a way for people to just try healthy brands. Uh, and then we're about to launch like a corporate wellness kind of modification of the app that is today. So like partner with insurance and companies like an employee wellness tool and things like that. So we have like multiple products mm -hmm. and then the app is kind of like the first one that we did. Okay, so the, the, the epicenter of this app is people go work out, they log their workouts and it's giving back to charity. But with that, you're obviously bringing users, you're bringing the brands that are giving back to the charity, you're bringing charity. So with that app center, you're then building off the blocks to do all these other things. Yeah, so it's like the, the core function of it, like we built out of uh, behavioral economics, we, par we partnered with the number one behavioral economics, uh, kind of like professor, researcher, just like guy, he's the man. Okay. Uh, turns out he's based in San Diego, helped him, uh, or we partnered with him. We helped like kind of underpin the incentive model with his research. Okay. So a daily pro-social reward of donating a meal and then a weekly long-term personal reward, which is like when you donate, you earn points and can redeem them for free products. Traditionally it was restaurants. We've now launched groceries. Now people can get free groceries at like Walmart, Kroger, places like that. Cool, okay. Obviously after the show, you've had a lot of monetary success. So is Hannah. But one of the questions I got to ask before we move in on the timeline is, I think people hear this and say, okay, eight months, you're taking a salary that's under market value or you're not taking much money. And people out there, like they want to start doing something like this, but they can't afford it just because of the cost. What is your suggestion to them? And were there any tips that you have that allowed you to do that? Besides raise money? <laughs> <laughs> Both are good. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard to start a business and not raise money. Uh, I think like cash flow positive businesses out of the gate are few and far between. So especially like tech, like that's a super, like tech debt is a real thing where you have to just like pay a ton up front to get the tech to the point to where it starts like flipping and becoming a cash flow positive asset. But um, yeah, it, it's really just like, I don't know if you listen to how I built this, but every single story is the same. They work a full time job, they figure out something they're super passionate about. And then there's that like inflection point of, am I gonna go do this full time and use my life savings to figure it out? Or am I just gonna like, stay at my job and let this idea die? So it's just like making sure you're comfortable with that. Obviously it's a lot harder to do that the older you get. So we started at 22, 23, like worst case scenario, we could have done something else. But like at no point in time over the past five years have I been like, oh, I need to start looking for another job. Like I just, I just know we're gonna figure it out, so. Gotcha, okay, so we've had the founder of Netflix come on, and then we've had Mark Laurie, billionaire who owns, uh, multi-billionaire who owns Minnesota Timberwolves with A-Rod. They both have opposing point of views on this. Uh, Mark Randolph, Netflix, OPM, swears by it. Don't do anything without other people's money. You have your skill set, you're doing it, you're putting your work, you're taking the risk, go get other people's money. Mark Laurie had 364K debt left to his name, put every penny into his business, left himself nothing, and then when he fundraised, it was easy because he said, I don't have any other choice but to succeed. Ended up selling that company for hundreds of millions of dollars. What side do you take, OPM or go all in? So I would say both. Uh, we went all in in the beginning <clears throat> to get it to the point to where you can get other people's money. Like if you start out of the gate, raise money, you're gonna give up a lot more than probably you should versus if you're willing to kind of like take the chance and bet on yourself, you can keep a lot of that equity and then come the fundraise, it's like the best of both worlds. Got it, okay, cool. But I mean, yeah, if you have if you have a fucking million dollars in the bank and you can start this business and get it to $10 million in revenue, then yeah, you should do that. Get like, after it. Like, 99% of the population can't do that. Understood. Okay, you get off the show. You're on Hannah Brown season. Get off the show. And I remember they they tell you to go, you, you get the opportunity to go in paradise. I remember you called me. Lori introduced us. And you were contemplating. You were contemplating pretty good about it for a lot of reasons. At least on the call you were. Was it that tough of a, of a decision or no? I think paradise, when we went on, like the seasons before aren't like what it is today. If that makes sense, I like, agree with that. There, there wasn't a drinking rule until I think our season or the one right before it. Like, the people, there are some people who would go on that are like not. I don't know them personally, but seem like not the coolest people. So it's like, okay, is this really worth it? Am I just like, I gave it a shot the first time, nothing really happened. Do I really want to like roll the dice again? To where like, okay, I went on the first show, wasn't hated, amazing, had a great time, met some awesome people. 
do I really want to roll the dice again and be like, yeah, let's try it again? Like, because like the risk reward, it, it's there's so much more risk than like you actually going on and finding somebody and oh yeah of like course like yeah if you're looking at it as a chance. business decision it's a bad it does not decision. it's a terrible business decision to go on if you're looking for some type of return or even love honestly yeah yeah that's for sure okay but you end up deciding to go what was the what was the one driving factor uh why not yeah, the why not so like i decided to go on the first one because i had just broken up with my girlfriend and my dad had just died so i was like fuck it like nothing's going right like let's give something a try um, and so then the second one, I was like, well, I might as well just like see this whole thing through. Like how many people get this opportunity in life? So I did it. I probably wouldn't have done it if Hannah didn't go. I think that was probably like a big factor for me. Um, so you knew before that, that you had your eyes on Hannah. Yeah. I, mean, I think everybody knows this, but like we went to dinner before the show, like me, her, Lori Wells. Okay. And like, I like had met her, like we were in a group, but I had like met her there and I was like, Okay, like if I were to go, like this is probably the person I'd want to get to know. Got it. And then when I got there, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Okay, so I, I'm terrible with like keeping up on the the bachelor no, so I actually didn't know that. So that's interesting. Got it. So you had that. You guys, you, you go have to a dinner. Bachelor burner account. Jason. Bachelor burner. <laughs> yeah, right here. Here we go. We're settling right now. <laughs> Anybody that thinks I have a bachelor burner account, logging in right now to Instagram. We're doing this live. I have three accounts there. Ramen noodle trading Ramen secrets. Noodle, you trading can confirm secrets, there Jason is Tardic, no Tyler other Cameron account. Fan. Yeah. <laughs> He's so full of shit. All right, there's the answer. Boom. All right. Now, so you go on the show, you get off the show. Obviously, it works out for you. I don't want to know the number because it's going to get us in trouble. But all I want to know is a yes or no. Did you negotiate with the show on compensation numbers for Bar Paradise? Uh, no. Okay. It, uh, will we get in trouble if you say the number? Uh, I don't. I don't know. People have said it before. I don't know. I'm, I always err on the side of caution these days. I feel like it's like a thing. Yeah. It's like if people get paid a few hundred bucks a, a day or something. Or, or did you do I a guarantee? I, like, no, I didn't do a guarantee because like I was just like. Yeah. I had like no. I've presence. talked openly. I've talked about my book everywhere about what I got paid it's or like what I got seven hundred dollars a day or something? something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think everyone's changes a little bit, but yeah, it's, it was something yeah, like that. But it's I, nothing I, that material. My I point is, you're it, not getting rich off it. Yeah, I think it ended up being like fifteen grand for yeah. the whole season. Yeah, or something like that. It's crazy. And then I have some of these Vanderpump people that come on the show, and I'm like, so I heard rumors you guys make twenty five k an episode. Just like, oh, it's way more than that. Yeah, it's and I'm ridiculous. Like, it's yeah. unbelievable. It's ridiculous. All right, so you get off the show though, it works out for you. You go right back to Vi or when was the moment that because your first time off the off Hannah Brown season you didn't have that many followers right no like no like no platform no platform whatsoever so, so there you didn't make did you make a penny off of no. Instagram before you went on Paradise no okay get off Paradise you blow up you're like the king yeah. of Paradise he goes yeah yeah <laughs> and I was what, like, you guys are on my season you no, guys are on my that season uh, and then when did uh, I actually remember the moment so okay. it, this is really funny I would go to no free ads. I'm not going to say the name of the gym, but Ooh. we went to this hit class. Uh, that right, by, no, it's F45. So I, I used to go to F45 all the time, and the episode was airing 5 p.m. or yeah, 8 p.m. Eastern, but it doesn't air until 8 p.m. Pacific time. So there's like a three-hour delay, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to take the like 4:45 or 5 o'clock class okay. at F45, and then like when I'm done, I'll go home, shower, chill, and then the episode will be on but it's airing on the East Coast right when I start the class. So I like put my phone away, come back out after the class. I like turn my phone back on. I've got like a hundred missed calls, a bunch of text messages. I'm like trending on Twitter as the banner person. <laughs> yeah. And then like, I think I got like 50 or a hundred thousand followers like within the first like one or two episodes. And I was like, oh fuck. Yeah, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. It was pretty insane. I was like, oh my God, uh, like what's happening? And then it just kept getting bigger. Cause like the first, I mean, that had to have been one of the most watched seasons, I feel like. Uh, Hannah Brown's. Uh, Han well, Hannah Brown's and, and then, and then Paradise, Paradise right yeah. after. I feel because like it was one of the Hannah most. Because Hannah came from Colton season. Yeah, which yeah, also so those was are two really massive seasons. Season. And Hannah had, she had a bunch of followers, though, from Colton season, yeah. right? She had like a million or something coming into the to Paradise. I mean, that's crazy. Like, it's crazy. These days, like, that's no way. It, yeah. Was she making money before she went on Paradise, like with ads and yeah, stuff? Yeah, I think okay, so. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so, yeah, it just like exploded and every single week, just kept getting crazier and crazier because for the first, like, I don't know, eight, maybe like six episodes. It's just Hannah Blake and I, like that's the whole, oh, the whole drama, the whole oh, drama. Yeah, right, and so right, it's like right, you're right. just spotlighted for whatever 
like a month long of yeah. the show and it's just like incessant and i was like oh my god this is insane and then it kind of came down and then like when the show ended it went back up and then now gotcha. it's like okay so and then monetizing with that after the show tell me a little bit about that journey like the first opportunities things you've learned just the whole the whole breakdown of first, monetization yeah first yeah. ad was with liquid iv to do a story love that yeah shout out uh, shout out brandon and hayden but it it, it just like yeah i'm so bad at it i'm still pretty bad at it to be yeah. honest because i'm just like i feel like it's not me yeah um what's not you just like doing ads and stuff yeah. like they're, they're I, i'm i've gotten better at doing things that i like okay like i like partnered with um i brought like a few health and wellness products like and wearables and things like that and it's like that's actually what i do all day so okay. that makes sense but like doing like an app shocker thing like isn't really that's not gonna do it it's not you. gonna do it for me so gotcha. uh yeah, it's super interesting. Like you're, you're. It, this was three years ago. Now there's just so much money in influencer marketing that it's crazy. It's, and like I work with the brands that pay uh, that these pay people. these people. Yeah, and we're I'm gonna like, get into that. And I'm like, oh my god, like there's just so much money and like one of the new products that we're launching for Visor next next year is like something to actually enable tracking for these things. Like when you're a food and beverage brand and you partner with an influencer that you just launched in Walmart, you have no way of tracking how many people went in and bought your product versus now we're about to launch something that will let you do that. Oh, so you're saying if you are promoting, a, you're promoting some type of CPG, or you're promoting some type of something, uh, and you're saying you're not directing them directly to the link, you're actually sending them to a retail store, there's no way to track it. No way to track it. Gotcha. It's and so impossible. That, and so then what are you doing to do that? We're, we're using, like, we have a point of sale integration, and we're creating kind of like, you can call them mobile offers that people can generate on their phone, walk in, scan them at checkout, and so you know they came exactly from this ad. But you do agree, especially as an investor in some of these companies, which we'll get to, you do agree that influencer marketing in general is probably one of the most optimized ways to put a, ooh, he's what you, giving me a look. Where are you going? Put a product in front of people for the most efficient way. Uh, yes, I guess. I think it's overpriced. Okay. Like, I, I actually, like, I think macro, influencing is on its last legs and i think like people really want like micro hyper engaged communities yep but like where are you going to get a five dollar cpm by like you work with an influencer you pay them 10 grand they get i don't know 100,000 views or 500,000 story views like that's a pretty good deal that's pretty good yeah that's all you care about what's the alternative if that's all you care about yeah versus like Instagram and Facebook, the iOS update, it's like in pot, like acquisition costs are like $50 and higher, which is not sustainable. Yeah, that's not sustainable. But yeah, if you're looking for impressions, I don't know that there's a cheaper way to get it. Yeah, it's just like, are there followers in India? Like in your products based in the US? Like, how can you How can you out? convert that? Yeah. So like, like getting more detailed with the analytics. Yeah. So. yeah. I would say that we're seeing um, definitely, a lot, especially CBG companies are getting so much more efficient with the way that they are doing influencer marketing. And there are companies out there like, I mean, I'll throw a couple up, like a Beam CBD, right? Like Beam's doing well. Beam's doing well. They Beam's are well. some of the toughest negotiators when it comes to influencer marketing. And Beam's that's what well. you're seeing. You're seeing a lot of these companies do really well with um, how they're negotiating. Well, the, the big companies like have just an ungodly amount of money to throw at it. Yeah, like yeah. insane. And, and like the, we're talking like Fortune 500s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The big yeah. companies. Like, and it's much cheaper than a five. I just looked up yesterday. Or Six point five million for a thirty second uh, commercial for Super Bowl. Yeah. This Super Bowl coming up. Yeah. So it, why? Yeah, but like if you're saying a hundred million people are going to watch that, and then someone who's going to put up a million dollars, a million impressions on a post, who's going to take it for 25, 35 grand, yeah. it's a no brainer. You'll take it all day. All day. And what I think a lot of brands will start doing next year is just paying people for content and less about their following and audience and just saying, like, you're a good content creator. It's actually super time consuming for me to go film and take photos and all this stuff. 100%. So, like, I'll buy this content and I'll pay you an extra 15 grand for me to have 12 months usage and just boost it all over social media. Well, I've talked to some CMOs and what they're doing is the other thing too in social media for anyone out there that doesn't know is you'll, you'll get that the deal, right? 50K for a post, it's a one-off, but then you do one, you're done and you'll never see them again. They're, I hear what they're trying to do is a lot of influencers are trying to sustain like, like what can I make this year? So companies will say, we'll put you on a retainer, like three, 5K a month. You uh -huh. don't post it, don't touch it, just create the content for our page yeah. and then they have their entire social media we, outsourced. We paid a girl $1,000 a month to post on TikTok for us. Interesting. It, it's it's such a good deal. Like, it like for a brand to pay somebody, call it five grand a month, and they give you 
20 pieces of content that you can like white label and boost and all that stuff, it's so worth it. Got it, unbelievable. Okay, with you influencing social media in general, have you made a pretty good amount of money doing it or are you just like, I'm done with this? Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, like, it's, it's pretty awesome. Like sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I like get to do this. So I definitely feel very lucky. Uh, but I just take essentially every dollar and invest it in, and like food and beverage, like high risk CPG brand. <laughs> okay, so the money that comes in from influencing, you take every dollar, put into high risk. Pretty much, CPG. Yeah. Okay, I well, just let it ride. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Times taking. You take the money in, liquid IV. I'm making this up. I'm not saying, but they, let's say they pay you eight grand for a story. They pay you eight grand. You got eight k. You go put it into investment. What type of criteria are you looking for when you invest into a small company? Yeah, so I usually do like ten to fifty grand somewhere in there. Um, it depends on the terms of the deal. Like I, you, I want to get at least a tenth of a percent, like at a bare minimum. I've done a few where I didn't do that. Like I kind of want to stick to my, like moving forward. I kind of want to stick to that kind of like thought process. Um, but yeah, I, I look for the brand. Like, is this a cool brand? Is this something people would want to post about just organically and, and see it's got to be in the better for you space. So some type of like healthier products in it. Would you say dough cookie dough is in the better for you space? I would say dough <laughs> is in the better for you space. They okay. are using uh, better alternatives than Good really any other cookie dough company out there. And like, I'm of the belief it's impossible to take somebody who's eating Lay's chips and turn them like vegan and working out like 20 times a week but small versus, steps. versus if you break it up into small steps like it's scientifically proven to work to make people healthier uh so i'm a fan of healthier alternatives it's the same reason why i'm a big fan of like olipop and poppy over pepsi and coke um so yeah i, I look for the brand better view space the founder really that's all you're betting on when you're doing like pre-seed to series a is like is this person going to figure it out and then like I'm starting to add like retail doors. Are you in a thousand doors? Like, okay, are you like over a million in revenue? Like things like that are kind of what I'm starting to like include in my process, but I don't lead deals, usually follow on on when you've got terms set by a VC or high net worth individual or something like that. Love it, okay. Doe, I also want to put out there, huge fan of it. Sabina, the founder, got to meet with her a few times from an introduction from Dylan. She's un unbelievable. So I was just poking fun at Dylan. Doe is an incredible uh, company, check it out. Can I give people the website here that yeah. I'm looking at. Okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. If you're curious, the the companies that uh, in the thesis, I mean, some of the stuff about Dylan that just blew me away is just the due diligence, the thought process, um, the the business acumen behind his decision making. He has a site called Barber B A R B O U R dot VC. It shows his portfolio, thesis, media, and every one every company that he's invested in. So I'm just looking right now, right? You got Ranch Rider, you got Babe, you got Bo Bomani. 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 You got Moku Jerky, Doe, Mezcla. You have Chubby. You have, I mean, there's a ton. Dream Pops, uh, Honeycomb. There's a ton of them in yeah. here, right? I've so, done 15. I think I've done like 10 in the past year. So you're at least, if it's 10K, 15, you're at least 1.5 in on this stuff. Uh, if it's 10 to 50, 10 to 50K, I think I'm around like 500,000. 500,000, okay. Somebody check me on my math. Oh, no, no, you're right. Okay, this is my fifth interview today. That was way off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking 100K. I, I, think, I think it's 10K. around 500,000. Okay, so around yeah, 500,000. 500, so you have made a comment that you're not in, you're not investing into these companies like someone that's a high net worth investor. What are you doing different? Like, in, in your, what sense? Your negotiating tactics, how to get in, how to not be part of a syndicate, yeah, how yeah, to get yeah. extra I, equity. I, I pretty much refuse to be part of a syndicate because they generally have fees and a carry, and I just think that's like, like for me in my position, I work with these people. I will not agree to that. If like somebody has zero connection to the space, maybe it makes sense to a syndicate. Uh, moving forward, I think I'm like super founder founder friendly because I'm a founder myself. I think like maybe if I assuming some percentage of these exit and I have cash to reinvest again, like I would probably be more like like harder negotiator in terms of like. I can add a lot of value, so maybe doing some sort of like equity preference of putting in, you know, call it a one to one, 15 grand and getting an extra 15 grand and like advisory shares or something like that. Um, just because like I have a platform I can introduce to retailers, just like as another founder, connections in the space. And I just feel like I'm just so founder friendly that I'm like, hey, listen, like I just want to be along the ride and support. And if you can help me out in my journey too, then we can both win, so. I love it. That's probably what I would do next time. Very cool. Have you, with your financial acumen and, and business acumen, uh, I look at myself and the way I've kind of 
Caitlin has taught me so much, but I'm able to help and advise a lot on this stuff. And uh, people will come to her with deals all the time and we'll take the calls together. Have you been able to help Hannah with this stuff? And she, has she gotten involved with some st- seed investing? Hannah's in a few. Uh, yeah, I think she's in Ranch Rider, Bomani, and Moku. Uh, and Doe now. So shout out Doe again. Um, yeah, Hannah, Hannah wants, she's like super smart. She's like, I don't want to over... Like I've probably over invested into CPG, but that's just like what I do all day. So I feel like I have a good idea on who may do well and who may sure. not. Sure. Uh, but she like does influencing. She's launching her own personal company. She like has invested in seed brands. She wants to start like buying some rental properties and Airbnb. So she's like really smart about diversifying and like very proud of her for doing that. Me on the other hand, I'm like, fuck it, let's go all in. Like, give me your high risk, CPG. give me your high risk plant-based smoothie. I'll take it all. I day. love it. I do have an uh, uh, Airbnb potential opportunity in Nashville. We should talk about it. Maybe okay. theme it all bachelorette, but we'll get to that. Let's go. All right. Good stuff. If someone is out there investing and this is too complicated to them, they're like seed investing. All the stuff you're saying is too much. And also guys stay tuned to the recap. You guys know the curious Canadian. He is going to be confused by a lot of the jargon that Dylan has put out there. He is the man and he will ask me definitions. We'll talk through those. So stay tuned. If you are feeling a little confused someone that is a little bit of a more novice investor they are sitting on cash in this crazy environment right inflation's up the ass don't know where to go the market's turning left and right what type of investment advice would you give to someone uh i i if i had money right now i'd be buying real estate so i think rates have come down there's a period of time there's a period of time there where investment rates were lower than personal rates like if you were to go buy a, a personal house and get a personal mortgage like your rate could be like seven or eight percent and the investment rate was six which i thought was insane so that's probably what i would be doing right now i wouldn't invest in i, I like yeah I, again i'm not an investment advisor i think you like legally have to say that but, yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> i don't know I, I really like real estate that's probably the next thing i would do um stay away from crypto <laughs> okay good, good uh, advice yeah stay away from crypto but yeah i, I mean if you're interested in like investing in in consumer brands like if we're going to go into a recession alcohol brands usually do well in a recession mm-hmm. so you can look up like on any we funder angel list like any of those websites and can invest like as little as 500 bucks love it uh, so that's good advice i i also like being involved in the alcohol space i think because uh, like you said, it's a great hedge against uh, just the mayhem that's happening. It's definitely not cyclical. Um, STZ is my favorite. Rochester, New York, Constellation Brands. Constellation Check Brands. them out. Again, not investment advice. Ranch Rider. Mm-hmm. Ranch Rider. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one day Constellation might buy Ranch Ride. They might. That'd be cool. Constellation, if you're listening, you totally should. And I have a funny Ranch Rider story. I'm sitting at the, uh, Caitlin and I are on the sidelines of the Green Bay Packers game. And all of a sudden, a kid comes next to us. His girlfriend, I think at the time, I don't know if they're engaged or married, uh, was like, oh, fan of The Bachelor, what are you doing here? You're a Bills fan. And I'm like, you know, Caitlin and I are like, no, no, we're, we're just supporting. We have a good friend, whatever. The boyfriend comes in and goes, oh, you're from The Bachelor? Like, I do deals with uh, Dylan and Hannah. I'm like, what? You do deals with them? So all of a sudden, he starts telling me about Ranch Rider. So you invested with him. Yeah, Brian. Okay. Now, yeah. the other thing I didn't know is just thought there were two random people. All of a sudden, the president of Green Bay Packers, the chief of officer, the head of the head, comes in and, like, hugs him. And I'm like, how'd you know him? He's like, oh, it's my dad. What? Yeah. His dad is the president of Green Bay Packers. I have to How call. did you not put that together? I have to call this. Yeah, that's we were on the we were on the field. Well, so that's why he said I told him I was like, yeah, I'm going to the game on the 19th. He was like, oh, well, do you want field passes? Yeah, dude, his and dad's I'm like, the I'm president. Like, How the fuck do you get field passes? <laughs> okay. Unbelievable. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a call. Little do you know, you well, are you investing. Should get, you should get Aaron Rodgers fund to invest. There you go. Wow, our X3 fund. We've talked about that when Kelly Flanagan came on. Holy smokes! All right, I want to quickly. We got to wrap up here soon. Visor. Um, I did see and read that in the early years of Visor, you entered and won a startup competition, and split a million dollar prize. Is that a fact? That's a fact. We should have won the full million but we tied what was this thousand. what was this competition uh it's the alliance healthcare to a, gr- a great a great foundation uh they actually ended up investing into visor uh themselves which was great um i think it was like right when i got back from paradise a week later we were pitching in the final pitch competition so that was a pretty wild experience but basically it's for companies that were forwarding the health kind of improvements in san diego and so we won because we were using behavioral science to like kind of underpin our incentive app to make people work out more and introduce them to healthy brands. That's cool. 500K. What'd you guys do with it? How'd you spend it? <sighs> Got a table. Uh, no, I'm just <laughs> Literally a conference room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, um, 
Yeah, I mean, we started to pay ourselves, I think we paid our, pay ourselves like 30 grand a year or something like that. Uh, hired our COO, hired a few more people, and it's just really like operating capital at that stage. That's pretty cool. Where does the company stand today? How are things going? Raising capital, how has the growth been? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I mean, we're, we're up to 14 people, and, wow. over, and over five years, we've only raised a million and a half dollars. So we're- That's impressive. Super lean, try to run the company off revenue. Um, it's going really well. I mean, I, th I think 2023 is gonna be an exciting year for us. Um, I think we grew revenue a little over 200% from last year in another recession. Like, it's so brutal. 2020, COVID shuts everything down. Yeah, 2021, go still kind of like, uh, this year, sh shit starts to pick up again. June, everything shits the bed again. And then everyone's like super scared for 2023, so. But yeah, I mean, I, I think we're in a good spot. We don't really need to add that many more people to the team. We don't really need to like increase our burn a crazy amount. So it's just like, all right, the product's ready. Let's start getting some brands involved. Let's start making people healthier. There you go. The burn. That's another one. We'll talk about that. There's a lot of jargon here. We're going to talk about in the recap. Stay tuned. I got the last question. We'll, we'll show you how to get the visor wrap. Last question I got for you. I don't want dates as a guy who always asks me. I could care less. But as a finance guy, I need to know. When you look at all this wedding stuff, right, <laughs> right. When you, even I don't even know if you, I don't care yeah, if you talk to a planner. I don't give a shit. Right whatever, now, whatever. Okay, done. so you're in the process, almost done. So yeah. you're there. But talk to me about just your take on the cost of anything wedding and how you're managing as numbers and finance. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's nauseating. Yeah, it's overpriced. I, I was saying we should just tell people we're having an event and not tell them it's a wedding, and we'll probably get half off. So Sean Johnson. Okay. Yeah, uh, Andrew East, yep. right, right? You know, shot. She told me what they did is that because she has a charity, she just told vendors when they met with them, it's for a charity event. Yeah. And she said the same exact product, the same exact things were coming in at one fifth of the cost. Yep. Just ridiculous. Yeah, it's we're 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 trying to get like we so we know somebody who makes champagne, so I think we'll be able to get champagne. We know somebody who makes tequila, so I think we'll be able to get tequila. I've talked to a few beer brands, think we'll be able to get some beer. Great. Don't have to pay for that. Uh, there's a lot of things you can get. There's a lot, you're there's probably a few, gonna get it, but there's still there's a few things we can get. But it's there's still a lot of things you can't like, get though. Yeah, like I mean, uh, I mean, maybe you have a flower connection, but usually flowers no are flower tough. Connection, venue connection, and if you do it abroad, it's different. If you do it in the U.S., it's different. So we're like managing that right now. All right, what does one person not know about Dylan and Hannah when it comes to business or career that might be interesting? Um behind the scenes other than you're a gamer we know you're a gamer you're yeah. not are you going to take that professionally uh i wanted to stream for a minute there you did yeah for a minute i was like i should stream i'm very funny have you <laughs> i'm very <laughs> self-proclaimed self-proclaimed no i um I, I i did it for a little bit just for fun uh during covid i thought it was super interesting i kind of wish i it, it's just a time commitment and like a lot of the things I don't do because I have like a full-time job, which I think is probably the number one misconception is that people think I just like sit on my ass all day on social yeah. media. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say that the thing that people don't know about us is like kind of our, and like, I would say the investment side is like something that not a lot of people know. Um, and I'm super proud of it. I mean, I haven't, I suffer from imposter syndrome as I'm sure a lot of founders do. So just like trying to figure out it, it, is what I'm doing right am i right am i smart enough am i good enough mm -hmm. like that kind of thing nonstop. so yeah just like I, I would say that the business side hannah launching her own company like us trying to be like sustainable businesses outside of just doing sugar bear hair ads on instagram yeah i think that's well no said. offense to them by the way no they're yeah they've done very well for yes. themselves um the last thing i want to say because you, you led to a misconception about how people do think you don't work and you and hannah work your ass off can you give people a little context like how how many hours are you putting in how many hours is hannah putting in i just mean for perspective? I, I mean we started at 6 a.m today so it's four o'clock now i mean I, we're gonna be going until like 10 o'clock tonight um like Hannah's day starts a little later than mine, but hers goes late into the night because it's like setting up a content strategy, shooting content at night, planning what the week looks out, setting up photo shoots, like things like that. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it's a it's a full time job. Like I, I th there are some people who can get by on influencing working like two hours a day. Mm -hmm. Totally. Very doable. Yeah. I like, could do that all day and you make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. It's a great job versus like if if you rely on that and six months from now it's gone, you're fucked. Yeah. Totally. So, 
I love it. All right, one trading secret, Dylan Barber, something that people can't learn in a textbook or in a classroom or from anywhere, anyone else out there. What would Dylan Barber's life, money management, financial management, could be anything, what's your trading secret you could leave us with? Well, I wish you gave me a little prep before this. So I you could got time. We could just good. edit this out. Um, Come on, you're Mr. Fucking Whippersnapper, chirping everyone sure. on uh, Twitter, putting everyone in their place. Let's go. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little reckless. I, I mean, no, my 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 trading secret, which isn't really a secret, it's like it doesn't matter where you went to school, it doesn't matter what your grades were, if you can just like spend the time actually learning something and doing it, regardless of like how shitty or how dumb you feel in the beginning. I guarantee you. Like in the near future, you will be exponentially better than what you were before, and then a lot of people before you who've tried to do it. I love that advice, especially in 2022. There's so many places you can go to get information. You yep. don't have to sign up for the classroom session. You don't have to be at the university. You can be a student of your own. And like you kind of had said, I wasn't the you know I wasn't the 4.0 student. I just really focused on this and had the best outcome. Yeah, I love it. Yep. Awesome. Dylan, where can people find you and specifically Visor app? If you haven't downloaded the Visor app, where can people download it? It's on iOS and uh, Google Play. Just type in Visor. It should be the first thing that comes up. Um, and for me, just Dylan Barber on Instagram and the real DB Coop on TikTok and Twitter. <laughs> the real DP Coop. You haven't changed that. No, I'll keep it. Still, I you proud of that. You yeah, like that. Yeah, I'm Twitter blue, baby. Right. Nobody's Twi taking my blue track. Twitter. <laughs> oh, Twitter blue, Dylan Barber, unbelievable. Guys, stay tuned. We're going to download the Visor app. David's going to do it. I'm going to do it. We are going to do a full review. So you, I'm forcing you to listen to this, even though you don't want to. Please. Uh, very impressive, Dylan. Uh, everything you've done uh, through the show, outside the show, all the investing stuff. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, and congratulations on everything. It's truly, It's truly awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on this episode of Trading Secrets. All right. See you.